אוקיי. First of all, well, welcome, Carsten. We are so, 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 so happy to have you here. And welcome, Cecilia. Hi, everybody. Ciao. Thank you for having me. Ciao. Ciao, ciao a tutti. Scusate che non posso essere lì di persona. No, no, but you are here with us. So we feel you here. <laughs> and uh, I think it's great because, we, you know, in a few, let's say, minutes, we are ending, including this uh, edition of, uh, of the Salone del Mobile, the Super Salone. And uh, it's so great to have both of you here with us. I think it's, it's also a, a sign of how much we have changed uh, the idea of exposing design and furniture in, in these in, in this last days. And uh, uh, so, I, I, Cecilia, maybe I ask you to run a little bit our conversation because you know, uh, you know uh, what we have done. Uh, we all know what Kasten uh, has done in, in this. And this could be great to, to, to have you as a moderator of this conversation and course, part of the dialogue, too. And thanks, of Cecilia. Course. Cecilia is a, well, not only an amazing curator, but uh, someone who has really changed the way to uh, also to, to find new format of exposition in the art field. And uh, so we are extremely thankful for what you have done. Well, you You're very kind, and uh, again, I'm sorry not to be there in person, but I'm excited to be uh, discussing with you uh, this great topic about the relationship between art and architecture. And of course, you both are uh, incredible players when it comes to um, these two fields. So um, I think what uh, I'm interested in exploring today through the work of Carsten is also um, thinking about uh, uh, the intersection between art and architecture and uh, how, Carson, you've been able to, um, to through your work, to uh, transform the architectural space, both literally and metaphorically, and exhibition space, meaning both the museum, uh, the galleries, but also the landscape and the outdoor spaces. So I know, Carson, that you have uh, um, brought uh, a presentation of some examples of your work. So maybe we can start uh, from those and uh, discuss one by one your different approaches to, um, to the exhibition space and to architecture and, uh, and take it from there. Yes, um, we, can, we can do it like this. Um, we can just start with the first slide. Uh, <clears throat> I think we should start with the title of uh, the talk that Basically, architecture is not art. Uh, we, uh, next slide, please. Um, that there's a difference between architecture and art. I don't know if, you know, the intersection certainly is more obvious, but what is the difference, I think, would be interesting to talk about. Um, so, in my life, I've been doing one thing together with a very close friend, Marcel Odenbach, which is this house which I would consider to be architecture because it is uh, really built on the premises of what I consider to be architecture, which is it has a certain, um, uh, how can I say, function or like a structure behind it, which is not exceeding the demands. And I will come back to that when I make the difference to the next work. So just to show you this one work, one house that we built together, it's a house that we call House Turtle. It's built in uh, Ghana, in West Africa, on the coast. As you can see, it's a house that is built in concrete and also uh, some wood. Um, and it is a house in the next slide. You see it is uh, overlooking the sea. It is an interesting uh, place to build in Ghana. If, uh, if there's some architects here, I can uh, really, uh, you know, it's an architect's dream in the sense that there are no building regulations, really. So you can build whatever you like. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's quite fantastic. Uh, so here we have like a, a, like a terrace going out on the sea and the terrace has absolutely no balustrade whatsoever. So it's pretty dangerous. But, you know, uh, we, we are just so used to this idea of a balustrade. We think we have to have it. But if you have no more uh, constraints, you can just uh, skip it if you want to. And it works very well. 
Uh, you can do it legally. You can do it also legally in <laughs> part of the European cost in Italy. There are you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, there will be some people complaining, and then you get like like a fine and whatever. But here it's legal, so that's even legal. legal. <laughs> you know, it's legal, so you can do it. It's a paradise. Um, next picture, just very quickly. So it's a house on stilts, and now I want to just speak about function. <clears throat> so function is, it's a house in a hot climate. Um, so we want the air to go through. You saw it in the images before. There's no doors in the middle or anything. It looks a bit unfinished, but basically it's an open thing. The air and the wind and the, the rain and whatever can go through if there's a storm. But there's always a draft going through the house. So even behind, you can see um, there is, uh, you know, some parts are open. We cannot even close them as a door. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing. Then there's some, some snakes and some mosquitoes that we didn't want to have. And then <laughs> I also wanted to make an experiment with this house, uh, which is that we, we, we built this without any uh, rectangular <clears throat> angle. So all the angles are uh, either 90, uh, 93 or 87 degrees. Everything, it's like tiny, tiny bit of difference. Because the roof is inclined by three degrees, so we thought we also make the walls uh, not 100% 90 degrees. A little bit joking with the idea that in Africa you cannot make right angles, but then you know the angles are actually very perfect and they're 87 or 93 degrees. This is, um, I think, the last. Do we have another slide of this house? I don't. Uh, yes, so there you see wow. where it is. It's a very nice setting, it's a beautiful house. Um, and Ghana. So it's on a hill. It's on a nice hill. It's not, it's not down. Yeah, it's on a hill overlooking the sea. It's not on the beach. It's okay. on a hill. And can you say something about how you started this project and why did you choose that location? And is it a very kind of why, banal why question? We know, we know, but why Ghana? Is, I think it's important to know. Yeah, but why not Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> There's no reason why not Ghana. It's a very nice, you know, like uh, climate-wise, it's perfect. I live in Stockholm most of the year. And, you know, Stockholm, I don't even have to say how it is in the winter. So um, I love birds, uh, especially migratory birds. I want to be one of them. So we can go there in the winter and then we come back in the summer. Um, but, you know, also like... I've been a lot in West Africa. I, I really like this country. I, I, I love to be there. For me, it's very important to, to see what it does to me. So I do it, you know, out of personal reasons. I want to be influenced in some way, like I'm influenced to be in Italy, like I'm influenced to be in Sweden. There's no way around it. But this is a good place um, <clears throat> to be influenced by its uh, surrounding and to somehow see what happens when you, when you are there in a the house and you, you know, you live daily life, but under different conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and how has it changed since you have built it? Or has your perception of the house changed at all since you built it? No, it's like, because the only house I built together with Marcel, every time I come there, I think like, wow, we did this, it's amazing. <laughs> you know? so it's did you like, work with an architect or did you just do it yourself? I, I actually built it myself uh, and at nights I had like, you know what is balsa wood? It's like very, uh, yeah. you know, uh, thin wood and I bought this like saw. So I built like a model at night, every night I was building on it, took some parts away. And then we, we had some architects who made like proper uh, drawings. <laughs> but this I would say um, is really a project of architecture. And I would like, if I can go on Cecilia, or you want to say more about this? If we go on to the what? next uh, project, if we can have the next slide, please. There's another house, uh, which I also built with another artist. Her name is Rosemarie Trockel. And this, I would say, is not architecture. So we, I think it's very, it will become very clear what is the difference. Um, this house is called House for Pigs and People. It is a house that we built in 1997 uh, for the Documenta in Kassel. And this house um, is basically it's just a very stupid architecture in the sense it's like, a, it's like a box with a door. And the house, as you can see in the next uh, picture, you see a, a drawing of the house. It is actually divided in two parts. So you see the little entrance on the one side and in the middle there's a glass wall. And on the other side there are pigs. And that's why this uh, project is called House for Pigs and People. 
So it's about making a, more than building a house which has a certain demand and is, you know, uh, even if all the freedom of Ghana where there's no uh, reason to build a balustrade if you don't want to, here there's another thing. So you see the people could go in from this one side, the house is only half for human beings. They are stopped by this big glass that you see there and uh, they're laying on this inclined plane and they can see the pigs on the other side. Um, yes, and the pigs, when they look at the humans through the glass, what they see is their own mirror image. So they don't even see the humans. But what happens is when you're there as a human being and you're laying on this inclined plane and you're looking at the pigs, first of all, it's a very nice thing to do because, you know, they were very lively and they were beautiful and they had like little ones. But also, it seemed like they look at, looked at you through the window like this pig does, but they didn't see you. They saw only their own mirror image. So the difference to the project before, I would say, is the difference of comparison, that you compare like uh, two different living, um, say, beings, humans and pigs, and you give them the same space in the same house, and you see... Um, not, but not the same... Uh Possibility. So, uh, human could see pigs, but pigs was what front of a mirror. Yes. First, we wanted to make it like it should look like an equal thing. But then, as we all know, it's not an equal thing at Good. all. The yeah. pigs don't go home at night. Yeah, yeah. They stay yeah. there. <laughs> uh, the pigs also had some advantages that humans didn't have. They had a shower. They you we eat pigs, and then then of course Eel we pigs. eat pigs. Yes, but um, the difference, I think, would be interesting to speak about. So here we really want to achieve something very different. We want to achieve something extra that is like, I would say, typical for art. But it's not very, it's not... I mean, a kind of excess. Yes. So you have to well, go, yeah. Yeah, or really comparison. Cecilia, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's very hard to pin it down because it's very different from, for every art project. But it definitely goes away from the functionality side, obviously, and then it introduces a crazy idea, which is that pigs and humans could be equal. And it makes you think about this when you lay there and you, think, you see you have the same space in the same place. It's a proposition. It's some kind of prototype of how you could possibly live together, even uh, though we don't and we all know that like on a daily basis you know we eat pigs and we, we do all kind of very bad things to them and we know they're very intelligent animals so it makes us consider our incapacity to understand something that is too foreign to us but still has a life that is valuable in yeah, mind, at a certain opinion. time we cannot avoid to to observe this image to go back to what was happening in, in in southern Europe uh, until, let's say, 50 years ago, in Matera, Matera in Sassari, Matera, where there was this case where people used to, 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 to cohabit with, with cows and pigs. So it's amazing how sometimes art is going ahead and at the same time is, has a very strong reference to what was very close in time also, if not, it's not aware of that. And Carson, yes. you know, I'm, I, I think what you said about the functionality is very interesting, especially in this la last case. So I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk about the role of utopia or if there is this kind of uh, magic uh, um, angle to this artwork that portrays maybe like, uh, like uh, Stefano said something from the past or this image of uh, living together between species that is a sort of a utopian vision. But I think that the idea of utopia comes back quite often in, in your work. So I, I'm curious if you ever think about that in those terms. Yeah, but utopia, yeah. Um, it's a good, it's a very big question I can say because utopia <laughs> is also like a very big idea. Um, I would like to maybe tune it down a little bit and, and call <laughs> it more thinking about how it could be otherwise. Like thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, we know how it is. But my, my job is a little bit to think about how else could it be. So I'm proposing not, I'm not you know, we're not saying, Rosemary and me, that we shouldn't eat pigs anymore, but we should say at least that we look at what we eat and that we try to understand to some degree what is going on, even though we can't. And that's the main point. 
because the, we can try as hard as you like, but you know, the pigs remain for us completely incomprehensible. And that's why we didn't want to make it really equal. We wanted to have one side where you can look through the mirror, a one, one way mirror glass, and one side where the pigs don't see you to emphasize the inequality and the incomprehensibility because the pig is completely incomprehensible for us. And this is somehow showing the limits of our capacity of understanding. And then it gets really interesting. I don't know if it's utopian, but um, it's, it's, in a way it is. Um, it, is uh, it is interesting to, to, to build, like in this case, I would call like a monument for our own impossibility to understand. Uh -huh. So great. Should we move to the next project? Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead, maybe. Yeah, um, then we have the slides that um, mm -hmm. we can show the next picture. Now, this is also the pigs. You see the shower of, yeah, well. that the pigs were using? They could push a button and then they took a shower. And they really liked this, actually. And, uh, but so it was the very pigs nice. that were pushing the, the button? Or the pigs someone? pushed the button. Yeah, really? Yes, and with the snout, they push a button and then uh, the shower goes on. So it was very much in use. Um, next slide, please. So this slide, Cecilia, you know very well. <laughs> <laughs> so with your husband, Massimiliano, uh, we made uh, an exhibition at the New Museum together in 2011, right? Yes, 2011. <clears throat> and. Um, in terms of art and, and architecture, it's maybe an interesting idea in the sense that this slide is really like going through the building. It is somehow violating architecture. It is uh, dealing with an existing architecture. So it's not that we built one. It deals with something existing, but it is actually doing something um, to it, which, uh, you know, you could even call invasive. It goes through. It doesn't respect it, it makes holes. Um, and then I've done other slides, uh, if you can see the next slide, which are more like a, a comment on the architecture. So here you have the Hayward Gallery in uh, London, which is a beautiful brutalist building. And this, uh, this um, building I wanted to comment on with two slides that are um, uh, going from the top of the building, from the roof down to the uh, lowest level. And they are called isometric slides um, because they are um, exactly the same. If you can just go back to the picture before, uh, the slide before, yes. So they make you go down the slide um, <coughs> uh, either in a clockwise way or in an anti-clockwise way. And this is a comment on the architecture because, first of all, it introduces a way of moving around in the architecture. It's not only just stairs and escalators and elevators that are there anymore, but there's also a slide that makes you go down at least. Um, and this is something that I'm proposing, by the way, to all architects to consider seriously the slide as a means of transportation within and in between buildings. I don't understand why architects don't take this idea up. This whole project is about the idea of bringing in the slide into daily life and to see how this could change our lives. And now we are maybe back to the utopia a little bit, even though it's a very small idea about utopia. But I'm convinced that if you take a slide every day, it would be a different world. Well, we should actually ask Stefano what he thinks about that, <coughs> about it's having to integrate slides in his building. It's, it's amazing. Normally, the point is that uh, you have to deal with a property, with, a, with a different owners, and uh, the land, uh, the rules that are normally, let's say, uh, obliging the, the different the buildings to, 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 to respect a certain distance from the, from the border, of, of, they, they normally don't allow uh, any kind of possible connection, but uh, well, it's. Uh, it, I think it's uh, so great. I remember uh, some years ago in Tokyo, we were uh, developing a, a project called the Bridge the Gap, where 
we, we was together with Hans Ulrich and uh, and Kast and so on. Where one of the idea was to have to work in the void in between the buildings, uh, and uh, so we were mapping an amazing variety of, of voids, and uh, and then trying to propose for any void uh, an, appro an approach was not simply about architecture, but I believe this is this is a uh, an amazing way in which Castle is uh, let's say. Uh, putting in evidence uh, a possibility, a potentiality, and that's what uh -huh. art does and architecture normally doesn't do. But why don't they take up my idea? No, no. <laughs> that <is> <laughs> so that's, we will start immediately <laughs> and we'll do it. But I have a question for you. Uh, I've seen what you have done in, in, uh, in uh, Palazzo Strozzi with Stefano. Yeah, Mancuso. Next slide, please. Ah, is that one? Okay, stop. I didn't know. No, yeah. I'm interested to, to know. Okay, this is what. Please, no. So, yeah, it, this is um, another project which is called the Florence Experiment, uh, which happened in 2019, um, 18, 19. And it's in the Palazzo Strozzi in uh, Florence. Palazzo Strozzi is. Just, just, just before the COVID, it was like some weeks, no? Yes. Closed, yeah. yeah. Um, and. Uh, this palace was built for the two sons of the family Strozzi, so it was, it's built in a very symmetrical way. It's basically divided in half, a little bit like the house for pigs and people. We also have to look this way. We can also turn around while we talk. And um, <laughs> because we speak about slides. Um, so uh, the two sons of the family should own half of the palazzo, so it's built in a symmetrical way. And I thought it would be interesting to take up again the idea from the Hayward Gallery in London of isometric slides, meaning slides that possibly influence, yeah, <coughs> sorry, influence you differently depending on which way you slide down, um, which, you know, we can talk about more if you want to. But uh, here it's two slides that are making a reference to the history of the building. So it's also like, it's not, this is, I don't think it's a very invasive project. We, d we don't touch the Palazzo Strozzi. Um, we, uh, it's a very, you know, protected building, but also like we don't touch it architecturally like we did with the New Museum in New York or even with the Hayward slides and some other slides. Here, it's very, it's just a proposition. It's very light and airy and people could go down the slides from the top. But here we introduced another notion which I think um, makes it into an interesting project, not just architecturally and also in terms of art, but here we introduce another notion which is that we wanted to understand something about the intelligence of plants. Botanic in a different Yes. So we wanted to know if plants respond to the emotion of a human being that goes down a slide in a certain way. And we, people that went down these slides, they had like a little pot here attached uh, to their uh, breast with a belt, um, if they wanted to. And uh, they took down a little plant, a little bean plant, down the slide. Both of them they could use. And then in the basement of the Palazzo Strozzi, we built a laboratory with uh, scientists that took your plant and analyzed this plant and uh, made some measurements, especially in terms of um, what they would emit in terms of volatiles, like chemicals that they send out into the air, um, and compared these little plants to other plants that went down the slides uh, with a sandbag, and the sandbag was producing basically the same speed as uh, the human beings. So we wanted to know in a kind of scientific experiment if it's possible, if the plants uh, respond to the emotions of a human being going down a slide. Because a slide is a very, you know, to go down a slide, we all did this as children, that's another question. We don't do it anymore um, as grown-ups really, but why, I don't know. And if we do it, we would see that it's almost impossible to be emotionally detached. You get affected by it. Some people shout, some people laugh hysterical, hysterically. Nobody really comes down with the same face as he or she had when she was entering the, slice, so the slide. So we wanted to know if the, the little bean plants would react to these emotions and compare them to the ones that went down with the sandbag. And we found 
a very significant difference in two molecules that the plants um, send out. There was also different in photosynthetic weight and in some other things that were measured. And it looks like these plants somehow actually wanted to say something with these molecules that they send out to the other plants that understand this uh, molecule. And here we find another difference. So uh, architecture has done a tremendous effort to go up with all the possible technology and so on. And what you are showing us is, a, is an amazing, uh, let's say, not a fort, but uh, the ability to go, to go down in a faster, easier way. So it's quite... quite <laughs> and a, I have a couple of questions too for Karsten. You know, I'm curious um, to hear your talk. I know this is another broad question, sorry, but uh, the role of science in, you know, in both in your research and sort of in the execution of your project. And then uh, I'm also interested in hearing you talk in particular in this um, work, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, violence and playfulness, because of course these are slides and, uh, you know, I was just in Ireland and my son who is six uh, was amazed by the idea of, uh, you know, of looking at them. And then he realized also how, you know, scary it would, it would be for him to go down. And I think it's not, the violence of the experience of these artworks, but also the violence towards architecture, as you, uh, you know, mentioned before, uh, in the case of the new museum, like having to to make a hole uh, in the floor, and I can see, see today, you know, the um, you know the sign and and the marks of that of that hole. So I'm interested again in in thinking. In here, you talk about this relationship between playfulness and violence. And then the broader question about science and the role of uh, uh, science in your research. You're really a specialist in big questions. Um, <clears throat> OK, so <laughs> shall we start? I think, since we spoke about slide before, to go down a slide is basically producing two emotions at the same time, which are uh, contradictory, if you want to call it like this. So one is fear and one is joy. And then usually, you know, <clears throat> probably in the state that you're in now, uh, more or less everybody, um, it's somewhere in between these two. Um, but when you go down a slide, what happens is that this in between these two states, ness is taken away and is replaced by uh, a, 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 you know, a simultaneous uh, presence of both fear and joy which I find very interesting because they don't seem to be really compatible, um, but they, they, with this very simple means of a slide uh, can be evoked and can then also be taken with you for the rest of the day because the, you know, the experience stays a little while and makes you then uh, being under the influence, so to say. You know, so whatever you do after this will be slightly different. And this is what I, I think is really interesting. That there's a way of, um, <clears throat> of you know, changing uh, people's uh, decision behavior, for instance, without really knowing where this would go. Um, so that's that's the the, the fear aspect. I think that's very interesting. And and then I, I always like to say that there was, uh, but I hope I can say it now. There was a like a a, a description of vertigo by Roger Caillois, it's like a French uh, mm -hmm. writer and a philosopher from the 1930s, where he said is a kind of voluptuous panic upon an otherwise lucid mind. When you go down a slide, wow. it works very well too. And then for the art and science thing, you know, I don't know, I've been a scientist uh, in my former life, and then I changed to become an artist. And I think it's actually very different. I don't think there's, they have much in common. There's like, uh, they're both like somehow looking at uh, explaining the world in a wider sense, uh, if you want to call it like this, but <clears throat> they have so different means and approaches and also like now, of course, like a whole cultural history of how this approach is, uh, you know, uh, brought into form that um, I think they are unable to talk to each other anymore. They have nothing to say. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, if uh, you look at the world through, uh, you know, the methods that or the 
explications, if you want, that science have produced, and you look at it from uh, from an, another viewpoint, say a more culturally influenced viewpoint, or like through art, um, <clears throat> you you might of course ask the question if there would be something else, you know, that could be used in order mm -hmm. to understand the world. So maybe. We, we always think like, you know, that's it, you know, we have our ways of thinking and then we can use like this or like that. But there's, there's probably more, like, especially when it comes to things that we cannot understand. So I always like this idea of consciousness. I think consciousness is interesting because it's something that both art and science is interested in. But science tries to explain it and art tries to manipulate it, if you say it <laughs> very, very bluntly. I think you know what I mean. And science has failed, in my opinion, uh, dramatically in explaining consciousness. They don't get any further. They know there's like a lot of neurons, you know, like firing and then synapses, synapses neural ne networks, you know, everything like this. But um, it doesn't explain consciousness. It just shows what is happening on a, a materialistic level in the brain, but it's not explaining what this is that we all know uh, and that makes yeah, actually the difference. Are that saying that we have a, a brain, a mind in the stomach. Yes. Did you read that? Amazing. Yes. <laughs> no? Yes, it's, a, it's actually a German uh, uh, yeah. uh, scientist. What's her name again? Isabel Stenger or something yeah, like something this. Like she, that, yeah. uh, she has been looking at this in more detail. It's very interesting that there's a lot of neurons uh, also in the Stomach. intestinal yeah, tract. Yeah, in the intestinal tract. Yes. So maybe uh -huh. the whole idea and, of and the but brain. But it's not clear what, what they the, what they control and how they. So what, for instance, which kind of madness or madness we could we could have in the stomach? In the yeah, I think we, we uh, there's a lot of madness in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be so. <laughs> Do you want to mo go more and depth? develop? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> It was pleasure. But it's also yeah. interesting because, you know, when I look at your slides, especially because they have the ability to infiltrate a given space, you know, I'm looking at this picture and I'm immediately reminded of, uh, you know, of the human body. And is that like a stomach? Is that like a spinal cord? Is that like a, a parasite that attacks an existing building? So I'm, I'm curious to you know, because you have realized so many of these uh, projects, I'm curious to, to ask you, what is it that you like in a, in a, in a given space or in a given building? Um, you know, I think this, this picture is incredible, but I've seen, of course, your work in, in many different configurations. So uh, I'm curious to hear you talk about what is it that you like in, in the existing architecture of the museums or you know, in general of your cities around you. If I may say something, uh, say something a bit provocative, I think we should, you know, like this whole idea, you know, there's a lot of museums are built nowadays for art everywhere and uh, many uh, are opening everywhere in this world. But at some point there's something very wrong with this because we, we, this, these are not built for showing art anymore. They're built for sure. other reasons. Um, they're mainly built for making, a, you know, like a landmark statement in terms of architecture, which is all fine. But then I think they should be there as a landmark statement in terms of architecture, and they don't have to be filled with art anymore. So um, I don't know if that's, that's really what you were saying, but um, uh, when I come to a space, it's very often like this that I've been asked to make an exhibition. And, you know, usually it's like there's a certain, there's a certain time it's from October to December. Then it's like, a, you know, like some other things like and constraints in terms of budget. I don't know. And then you have to somehow fill in this and adopt to the building, which sometimes can be, can be very interesting um, if the building works. And sometimes I think can be very complicated if the building is not working. And that's very often the case. Um, so my proposition would be actually to say like architects should build museum for architects and artists should build museums for artists. <laughs> let's see what let's Stefano thinks Stefano. about that. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a very, let's say, not provocative, it's a, it's a, it's a super uh, intuition and, um, and the point is that uh, normally uh, 
architects uh, are not able to do things for themselves. So uh, probably the worst, the worst result of our work is when we try to do something where we want to show our work. And, and, uh, and that's it. So uh, it is true that uh, we have many, many examples of, of museums that are there only for, let's say, uh, express and, uh, uh, if possible, to straighten the, the self-references of the architect itself. So uh, we know that. It is true, and uh, it's, and then sometimes, uh, and then sometimes uh, it uh, enters in the code of, of art. You know? sometimes uh, it, it's not intentional, but happens sometimes. So, so uh, I think in a way, uh, if we could do a name, uh, probably we could uh, reinterpret all the, the the profile and the career of Frank Gehry also from that point of view. What do you think, Cecilia? <laughs> well, without naming names, uh, I, I think mean, I mean, uh, without naming names. But it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bad of, of, of Frank. He's, he's, a, he's a hero in a way. So also in that, in that field. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think Carson also has some pictures of his recent project, uh, Luma, uh, and I wanted to get to that, uh, to that um, context, not just because, of course, it's one of the. Uh, the most uh, talked about new art destinations, but um, I'm curious also to see, um, to hear Carson talk about, you know, what it meant to, you know, to, to be involved in such uh, incredible building and at the same time exhibiting an artwork outside in the landscape, which seems much less in a way challenging or loaded like as it is actually the tower. Um, so I'm curious, Carson, were you involved since the beginning? Did you talk to the architect uh, um, when you were planning on the slides? Or how did the process, uh, um, you know, function with him? Well, you know, like, usually it's like this that you get involved later. Like, uh, the architect builds the building, he or she, and then the artist comes and fills it or wants to build a slide and on it, and then the architect says, says always no. Usually, so I didn't have <laughs> any contact with Frank Gehry at all because you know, okay. like, uh, I wanted to build the slides outside first, but then uh, yeah. that didn't really work. I can see that, that. <laughs> <laughs> for like a number of reasons. But so, in the Luma Alts, I made two works. One is two slides that I don't have an image of right now. Because it's also like brand new, <coughs> and uh, uh, we, we we don't have any any images. And the other work is not slides; it's something else. So if you can just jump over, uh, so two slides, and then go to the third slide from now. Um, hello. So we we take next slide, next slide, next slide, and yes, not this one. Next one, next one, this one. Yes. So that's in, in the park in Luma. Luma is also not just built by Frank Gehry. It is also built by um, Annabel Zeldorf, uh, who uh, you know, made a lot of the surrounding architecture uh, dealing with the buildings that were existing and that were tramway um, uh, production sites and repairing sites, and also by uh, Bas Metz, who made the, the landscape design. So in this little park with the lake, which hasn't been there like a few months before, we built this uh, black box there that you can see, which is called Seven Sliding Doors Corridor. And it consists of um, exactly what the name uh, is already suggesting, which means that there's like seven sliding doors in a row. The sliding doors are made out of uh, mirror glass, uh, like one-way mirror, which is actually the wrong thing to say here because you can access the corridor from both sides and it works from both sides. So it's mirror glass, but it's not 100% mirror. So you can look partly through and it's in different degrees. Maybe you see more on the next slide and then they should, yes. So you can enter this, the sliding doors open and then you have, you see like on the, from the outside, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what happens is that you go through, and then while you go through, uh, the doors open and close behind you, and you see and you see yourself, and you see other people, and they come and they disappear, and always like this coming and going, and at the end you're completely confused. And that was like 
what I was aiming at. I think there's a little film, but I'm not sure if it works. Um, can we see that? It's the next slide, there should be. Okay, yes, so. Yeah, it's a little bit like to be on, on a train, you know, sometimes when you, <laughs> when you cross kind of a train, you have this kind of amazing, super. And you've realized this work before indoor, is that right? <laughs> uh, yes, we, uh, I made this before indoors, I think the first one was uh, like 2004 already, but when we used whole mirror. And then this is like the, I think the final thing that now I will not do anymore. So that was like the best one ever because it has also has like this semi transparency. It is also depending on the light outside. So if the sun is very strong, it's very, very look through at night is basically hundred percent mirror. Um, there's also like a, an acoustic element from the frogs underneath. And so I think it's very yeah. psycho. I saw a lot of way. frogs when I was there. It was really sweet. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think I just want to go back maybe to for a second to Stefano to the larger question about museums and I'm curious to hear you talk about you know thinking about who the client is you know when you get commissioned a building and of course you know you get commissioned by by someone in particular but do you think of the functionality of the building and when is the artist coming into the picture in terms of uh, you know, the client who is not, for, of course, the only person that's, that pays for the, for the project, but is the, the person that will use the building the most and, of course, with the, with the public. So how, wh when does the artist uh, come into place in your thinking about museums? Well, that's a good question. Normally, I think, I think uh, Kasten is right saying that uh, the artist normally comes when, when everything is, has already been decided. So, <laughs> and... and uh, there are some, uh, let's say, exceptions, uh, but it's more about art pieces than artists. Just to give to give you an, an example, the, there is a, in the in, in the last 30 years there was one museum who was really different from the other, who was the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. It was probably the first example where uh, the architect was an Italian architect, Guy Olenti, was asked to uh, design the space for every single art piece. And, uh, and the Musée d'Orsay, I think, is still one of the unique examples of this approach to, 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 to a collection in that case. So, uh, but in that case, the, the artists were not there because it's basically a, an historic museum. So the collection was a historic collection and, and that was more. Um, uh, but I have not idea, I have not at the moment a uh, um, recent example of, uh, of uh, interaction between architects and artists and, let's say, clients in real time, in real time, uh, not uh, in a, let's say, as a sequence of intervention, but a simultaneous way to, to imagine, design and realize space. So, that's something that we should do. We can try to do it. I think it's super interesting. Yeah, I think my and proposition would be just to say one thing, uh, to start with a book. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it, uh, you can very easily propose ideas for museums, especially in terms of a book, where you speak to artists how they would like to have a museum. I, for instance, like also the idea to have an underground museum. There are some examples, but even the one, in the Frank Gehry one in Arles is interesting because, you know, you see a tower, but actually the main exhibition spaces are underground. underground. <laughs> and they're very big and very beautiful. Um, that's that's, that's uh, in itself. Uh, yes, so it's a surprise message. in that sense. But even like a museum that you wouldn't see at all, you just open a door and then you can never understand how big it is because you just have to walk through it. And all the different dimensions could be a very interesting thing. And I spoke to some other artists and also to... Uh, some people interested in the matter and some architects like Hietil from Snöhetta and everybody really liked this idea. So this could be very interesting to, to organize, to put some ideas together and to see where this, where this would bring us. Um, super, super, super interesting. Um, I have a question which is probably so uh, general and, and, and probably superficial and maybe stupid, but it's uh, about gravity. So I always thought that what you have done, what you do is 
in a way, let's say that, obsessioned by the idea of gravity. Is this true or totally? Yeah, because I, 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 I think it's one of the biggest constraints. It is, no? Every shape in the I universe mean, like is done by gravity. At the same time, we don't totally need it because everything would fall out of place. But yes, uh, I think gravity is probably one of the most underestimated uh, forces in terms of we just take it as a given, but we don't really know what it means. Yeah. So, um, and, and since we cannot change it, uh, I think the interesting thing is to imagine what 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 could be if what would be if it would be it if it would be different if it would be less if it would be more. But then I think, you know, speaking of natural laws, I also have a proposition to make. There's one more natural law except gravity that hasn't been discovered. So right. now I'm making like a big uh, statement here. So please take a notebook. No, but it's very simple. It's the law of change. Nothing can stay the same. It is very interesting to, it's a very simple idea, but I think the law of change, I don't know how it works, but I know it's there. It's another natural law. That's amazing, but uh, I, 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 yes, uh, what I think we don't know, we don't know, is also that uh, this, uh, there, are, there is an energy in the universe which is pushing everything in the same direction, no? so the idea of uh, the expansion, the only direction the expansion of the universe, everything but this has is, to change. It That's doesn't change, or it's, it's it, There's no everywhere. intention, it just has to change. It cannot stay the same. Yes. That's why architecture is also interesting, because it's meant to stay. But, you know, oh. it's relative. So, if you just think about the law of change as a, as, as a similar force to gravitation, I'm really specu speculating here, but, you know, because I have no idea how it would work. But the law of change, um, I think, uh, would be interesting to uh, consider, uh, probably especially in political terms, but also in, in, in you know, <laughs> with respect to everything else. <laughs> Super interesting. I think that's a that's a great. I don't know if we're running out of time um, or. We have here Maria, Christ Maria Cristina, please come. So Cecilia and, and Carsten. Maria Cristina, who Hello. is Good the afternoon, person who was everybody. really. Hello, Carsten. Translation. Thanks for all what you have done. And <laughs> I think it's a. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> we need you to, to conclude this uh, series of uh, <laughs> dialogues um, that you have imagine and produce, organize. Yes, first of all, it's it's so nice to see everybody together after uh, so long. Uh, and see you, you can move the Yeah, mask. can I? Stay, yes. Sorry. And um, I was I was very thrilled when Stefano Boeri called me to, to talk about his concept for the Super Salone. What I understood from the very beginning is that it was about sustainability and sharing, which is really something that it very, I care a lot. So I was, I was uh, excited to, to put together the public program and to, to bring to Milan uh, some of the most interesting voices on the creative uh, um, design, art, architecture, panorama. Hi, Cecilia. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for being here. <laughs> you too. Sorry, I'm not really there, but... <laughs> So, yes, so this is what we, we have been trying to do, to, um, uh, to bring people to Super Salone. I have interviewed um, Maria Porro, the president of Salone del Mobile, and she told me that when she was uh, young, she always, young, now that she's, she's still young anyway, uh, she um, used to go to the Salone the very last day on Sunday in order to see uh, her grandfather booth. And that was actually how it worked, you know, like, people, like normal people, not those that are in the field, were allowed to visit the Salone only one day. So I think that the idea of open uh, this fantastic, uh, some sort of, we can say, circus of creativity to everybody, it's, uh, it's very important. And the public talk is conceived with the idea of giving everybody the chance to listen to, to, to great profile, to great stories and uh, expertise and adventure. So this was uh, a little bit the idea of bringing uh, people like uh, Karsten or Alejandro Lavena or the different talks that we organize with the moderator. Uh, we pick up some subjects that we thought are, you know, crucial today. 
of course, sustainability, the role of women within institution, um, different and different kind of thing that we thought and we hope that you enjoyed. And I also want to thank Stefano Boyeri for, for inviting me and uh, uh, the whole team that, uh, that made this uh, Super Salone possible. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, Maria Cristina. Thanks, Cecilia. And thanks so, 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 so much, Carcel. Not only for being here, but also for two or three super important, crucial suggestions you gave us. So we have to think about how to put light in the buildings. Uh, and and uh, this idea of no reciprocity between pigs and human is uh, uh, it's so, so, so strong and so important in this high pocket way to, to, to talk about uh, possible cohabitation with uh, other species, which is, no, it's very, well, it's a trend, but it's, uh, and last but not least, your, your idea about to introduce a new, new law, universe about change. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Grazie you a tutti. Ciao Cecilia. Grazie, Grazie mille. Ciao, ciao, ciao Cecilia. Ciao, 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 ciao